One Friday evening, at the end of the sixth week of my online semester, and who knows how many weeks into this pandemic, I turned to my husband and I asked, is this what the end time feels like? Before he could answer, I rattled off a litany of evidence. Nearly 2,000 Americans killed by COVID. Hurricanes churning in the Gulf, fires burning out of control in California, new protests over police-involved shootings of unarmed Black citizens and lack of convictions in their cases, grief over the icons of justice we had just lost still fresh, months of being isolated from family members either aging or coming of age. Seriously, is this the end time? I repeated defeatedly. No, it isn't, hun, my ever optimistic husband replied. It's the beginning. I paused and I looked at him incredulously. Initially, I chalked up his response to the generational difference between us. He went to Woodstock and he remembers the Kennedy and King assassination. So he's experienced a little more of the moral arc of the universe than me. So you mean it's the beginning of the end? Clearly, I wasn't buying it. Today's gospel, one of the most challenging exchanges of the New Testament, especially just weeks away from a presidential election to end all elections, points to the impasse I was feeling. Matthew's account of Jesus' interaction with the religious leadership of his day comes as his own public ministry has made a turn toward its final days in Jerusalem. Trying to build a case against Jesus, the authorities force him into a no-win situation, presenting him a symbol of the people's oppression, a Roman coin stamped with the likeness of the emperor. If Jesus agrees to its significance, he's a religious heretic. If he denies its significance, he is a political traitor. Returning to that conversation about the end of days, I found my husband's answer as unsatisfactory as I usually find Jesus's oft-quoted response in this gospel. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Perhaps I find it unsatisfactory because I feel as though I can identify with the followers of Jesus in first century Palestine. Like them, I worry about the impact of the growing divide between those who have and those who do not. I want control over things that are happening to me. I am losing sleep about a future that feels increasingly apocalyptic, and I'm growing impatient with promises that are still unfulfilled. I want something more substantive from Jesus. Here was his chance to say, this must end, to place the blame where it belonged, and to kickstart his revolution. Moreover, here was Jesus' chance to give those of us who follow him more than 2,000 years later the mic drop language we reach for when reacting to increasingly untenable socioeconomic circumstances. In the midst of the polarizing swirl then and now, with life or death implications for real people, give to Caesar what is Caesar's sounds sorely inadequate and dangerously apathetic. But then, upon closer reflection, my initial sense of Jesus' inadequacy reveals the limits of my own thinking, or the empire thinking with which the religious authority hoped to entrap Jesus. He wasn't having it. The institutions that exercise power over people in Jesus' day still entrap us with the exhausting logic, dispositions, and habits of empire. They tell us that the outcomes we are experiencing are unavoidable, that there's no other way but this way, that resisting is a damned if you do, damned if you don't conundrum. Theirs is an inertia that comes with working within the parameters of a broken system. And again, in Jesus's brief exchange, in which he answers a question with a question, we really see he wasn't having it. Rather, he embodies the wisdom I once saw on a sign outside a church in Manhattan. Better to shun the bait than struggle in the snare. Jesus doesn't take the bait, perhaps because he remembers God's message that comes to us today from Isaiah. I have chosen you. I have called you by name. I have armed you and there is no one except me. I am who am does this choosing, does this calling, does this arming. We aren't chosen by the authority figures of empire, no matter what religious or political guises they moralize with or campaign in, or what certainties they claim to offer or platitudes they attempt to ply us with. We are chosen by God, and the God who chooses us has a dream for us, 
the individual us and the collective us that surpasses the imagination of empire. A good friend and Catholic educator from Melbourne, Australia recently advised me, don't go looking for solutions in the problem. In other words, empire thinking will not solve the problems of empire. And I think that's what Jesus is getting at. Reject the premise of the conundrum and solve for what we know to be true. God abides in us and readies us to love in the chaos of empire. The rest is just the snare. So coming back to that conversation with my husband, no matter how bleak or challenging or despairing or draining these times may be, and indeed they are, we are not experiencing the end of days. If we remember who has chosen us, who calls us forth and who readies us, then in fact, we're at the beginning of the beginning. <laughs>